Ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Knowledge Group webcast, Successful Patent Litigation Strategies and Tactics in 2017 and Beyond. Hi, I'm Laura Smalley with Harris Speech, and I'm going to start out our discussion on patent litigation with jurisdiction and venue. Section 1338A grants federal district courts original and sole jurisdiction over claims for relief arising under any act of Congress relating to patents and this includes claims of patent infringement and patent validity. In certain circumstances, a case presents allegations that simply involve patent law, but are not patent infringement or invalidity claims. The Supreme Court addressed this in Gunn versus Minton, which held that federal jurisdiction is based solely on the plaintiff's well-pleaded complaint. The complaint has to establish either that federal law creates the cause of action or established establish if there is a state law claim such as breach of contract that the federal issue is necessarily raised, actually disputed, substantial, and capable of resolution in federal court. While the success of the malpractice claim in Gunn relied upon the viability of patent law questions, um, experimental use exception as a defense to the on-sale bar, Federal law did not create the cause of action for malpractice, which arose under state law. Therefore, although the case raised disputed questions of patent law, the Supreme Court found that federal jurisdiction did not exist because this type of dispute was, by its nature, unlikely to have the sort of significance for the federal system necessary to establish jurisdiction. And the tricky area um, for jurisdiction is patent licensing disputes which in general are state law breach of contract claims. In general, you may be able to obtain federal jurisdiction if the case necessarily involves the determination of inventorship, invalidity, infringement, or enforceability. Other issues such as ownership are not generally sufficient to establish federal jurisdiction. I would like to note, though, that sometimes the courts have conflicting decisions on this. For example, the Federal Circuit held in the Yang case that there is federal um, jurisdiction where the breach of license claim requires a determination of infringement. In that case, the right to relief on the contract claim as asserted in the complaint depended on an issue of patent law, whether the stents sold by Boston Scientific would have infringed the plaintiff's patents. Likewise, the Federal Circuit has held that inventorship is an issue of federal law, but the Fifth Circuit has held that it has jurisdiction to hear inventorship claims. The point here is to be aware of the issue and look at the law in your jurisdiction to make sure you assert claims in a manner that will confer or defeat jurisdiction, depending on what you want, and whether you should allege or avoid alternative means of obtaining federal jurisdiction, such as diversity. There's an added wrinkle where the licensing dispute is bought brought by way of declaratory judgment action. The Medtronic case involved a licensing agreement that permitted Medtronic to practice certain Murawski patents in exchange for royalty payments. The Supreme Court held that the federal courts, when determining declaratory judgment jurisdiction, need to look at the character of the threatened action. In other words, the courts need to look at whether a coercive action brought by the declaratory judgment defendant would necessarily present a federal question. In this case, due to the failure of Medtronic to pay under the terms of the license agreement, Murawski could have terminated the contract and brought an ordinary patent infringement action. That action would arise under federal patent law and the declaratory judgment action, which avoids that threatened action, therefore arises under federal patent law. Note that the result may be different if the licensor's only remedy under the contract is a breach of contract claim. Next slide, please. The jurisdiction of the federal circuit is a bit different than the original jurisdiction of the district courts. And in some cases that would be brought in state court, for example, a breach of an agreement to transfer ownership could be sent to the federal circuit on appeal. The federal circuit has exclusive jurisdiction in any civil action arising under any act of Congress relating to patents, but also in any civil action in which a party has asserted a compulsory counterclaiming, a, a counterclaim arising under any act of Congress relating to patents. So here, um, even if 
the plaintiff's complaint solely cert, asserts state law relief. Um, if the defendant has a compulsory counterclaim that asserts relief arising under patent law, the federal circuit will have jurisdiction. The concept of what constitutes a compulsory counterclaim is governed by federal circuit law, which uses the transaction or occurrence test. Anything arising out of the same transaction or occurrence as the plaintiff's claim is a compulsory counterclaim. And in general, anything involving the same patents and the same products are compulsory rather than permissive counterclaims. Um, in the Reardon case, the plaintiffs sought to establish ownership of the patents at issue and defendants asserted a counterclaim for infringement. To make a case for patent infringement, the defendants needed to show that they and not the plaintiff owned the patent at issue. The success of the plaintiff's state law claims also depended on how those factual issues were resolved. The claims and counterclaims shared a close logical relation and arose out of the same facts. The Federal Circuit therefore had jurisdiction to hear the appeal even though the plaintiff's complaint only asserted state law claims. Next slide, please. Once you've determined that jurisdiction exists, you will need to choose the venue for your patent infringement suit. And right now, there are two venue provisions at issue. One, specific to patent infringement, provides that claims for patent infringement may be brought in the judicial district where the defendant resides or where the defendant has committed acts of infringement and has a regular and established place of business. The more general venue statute, section 1391, provides that except as otherwise provided by law, a corporate entity shall be deemed to reside if a defendant in any judicial district in which such defendant is subject to the court's personal jurisdiction. In the 1990 VE Holding Corp case, the Federal Circuit held that because sections 1391 and 1400 were in the same chapter, the broader venue provision of section 1391 allowed corporate defendants to be sued for patent infringement anywhere they were subject to personal jurisdiction. Therefore, specific jurisdiction in infringement action might exist in any forum where the accused products are sold or commercialized. In essence, after this decision, plaintiffs could bring patent infringement actions almost anywhere the defendant committed an act of infringement. Currently before the Supreme Court is T.C. Hartland versus Kraft, which may narrow the venues available in patent infringement actions to those provided in Section 1400. The issue in T.C. Hartland is whether Section 1400B is the sole and exclusive provision governing venue and patent infringement actions. If the petitioners are successful, then venue and patent suits will be limited where the defendant resides, which has been defined by other case law, as being limited to where the defendant is incorporated, or under Section 1400, where it has committed acts of infringement and has a regular and established place of business. Next slide, and I'll hand it over to my colleague, Jim. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Jim Muldoon, also from Harris Beach. And I'm going to handle, uh, we're going to do a little back and forth between Laura and I. Um, my first topic is on applicable burdens of proof. The burden of proof is the duty placed upon a party to prove or disprove a disputed fact, or it can define which, parties, uh, which party bears this burden. The burden of proof can also define the burden of persuasion or the quantum of proof by which the party with the burden must establish or refute a disputed factual issue. With respect to patent infringement, the burden rests upon the patentee and must be proved by a mere preponderance of the evidence. The burden of proof on issues of validity will always be on the infringer or the person challenging the validity of the patent. And here's where things get a little interesting. The burden of proof with respect to validity in district court is greatly influenced by the statutory presumption of validity in section 282A. The provision reads in pertinent part, a patent shall be presumed valid. Each claim of a patent, whether independent, dependent, or multiple dependent form shall be presumed valid independently of the validity of other claims and dependent or multiple dependent claims shall be presumed valid even though the dependent uh, upon which the invalid claim uh, rests has been found invalid. Because of this presumption, 
the standard of evidence uh, is clear and convincing evidence to show the patent is invalid uh, in district court infringement litigation. This case, uh, this relates back to a uh, recent challenge a few years ago in Microsoft Corp v. I4I Limited Partnership, uh, where Microsoft had argued that a lower standard should be applied where the prior art upon which the patent or claim is asserted to be invalid wasn't considered by the patent office should be on a preponderance. Uh, the Supreme Court came uh, back with a decision that clear and convincing evidence uh, was required on uh, in view of the statutory presumption of validity. Clear and convincing evidence under model jury instructions generally means that it is highly probable that the fact is true. Courts then typically instruct on uh, the mere preponderance of the evidence uh, with respect to other issues involved in litigation being slightly greater than a 50-50 call. Uh, and then they also then distinguish uh, the burden of proof in criminal law standards of beyond a reasonable doubt and while uh, beyond a reasonable doubt uh, as a standard is a, uh, approaching certainty, hearing convincing evidence is usually then uh, instructed to the jury to be between those two of preponderance and uh, beyond a reasonable doubt. The burden of proof on the issue of validity shifts when you're before either the Patent Trial and Appeal Board or in patent reexamination proceedings. Once the standard for an inter partes review, post grant review, or reexamination is met, uh, the proceedings is instituted. And then invalidity in that proceeding is to be uh, shown by a mere preponderance of the evidence. There are issues from which the burden of proof uh, will be relevant during trial uh, is in damages where a preponderance of the evidence must be shown on each element of damages that Laura will cover later on, for example, with respect to lost profits or price erosion issues. Next slide, please. One recent change in a burden of proof in patent litigation is this past uh, year's decision on Halo Electronics, Inc. v. Pulse Electronics, Inc. Prior to that case, uh, the In Re Seagate case from the Federal Circuit in 2007 had established a two-prong test for willfulness. There was a objective prong, uh, and then only if the objective prong was met, a subjective prong looking at the infringer's subjective pre-litigation knowledge of infringement. The court in HALO rejected the two-prong test and completely eliminated the objective prong, which had been used very frequently to uh, eliminate claims of willfulness, typically on motions for summary judgment prior to trial. Now willfulness must be shown only on a preponderance of the evidence rather than under the clear convincing standard, uh, and then the subsidiary issue of enhancement of damages uh, will be reviewed on appeal uh, under an abuse of discretion standard. Next slide, please. Also relevant to uh, issues in patent litigation are whether the particular issues are questions of fact or questions of law. Under claim construction, which under the old Markman uh, standard had been a question of law, the law has uh, since been changed so that the court recognizes that claim construction may have factual underpinnings. The Federal Circuit's review of a district court resolution of any subsidiary factual matters will now be under a clear error standard of review, principally because the trial court is considered to be in the best position to make factual determinations upon hearing of testimony of witnesses and weighing the credibility of evidence. Ultimately, the legal question of claim construction is a question of law and will be reviewed de novo as per the Teva Pharmaceuticals case decided in 2015. At this long settled issue has been that infringement of a patent is a question of fact that dates back uh, over uh, 150 years 
to the Winans v. Denmead case. With respect to invalidity issues, anticipation is a question of fact, while obviousness is also a question of law with factual underpinnings uh, that, again, will be reviewed uh, under the uh, clear error standard with respect to subsidiary factual issues. Willfulness itself now is a question of fact under the HALO decision uh, with the elimination of the objective prong. Next slide, please. Laura? Okay, thanks. Um, there are two main theories of damages in patent infringement cases. Um, first are reasonable royalties, which is a minimum under Section 284. And generally, reasonable royalties are based on a hypothetical negotiation, and experts and the courts often use the Georgia Pacific factors in that analysis. Um, it's applicable to all patent owners. You don't need to practice your own patent or compete with the infringer to receive this type of damages. A small subset of reasonable royalties is what is known as established royalties. And these are available when the patentee in general has consistently licensed others to engage in comparable conduct at a uniform or tight range of royalties. For lost profits, the test is but for causation, so whether the patentee would have made profits on its own sales but for the infringer's conduct. That analysis is frequently made using a four-part test known as the Panduit factors. In general, although lost profits are not specifically limited by case law to direct competitors, they are generally only awarded to direct competitors or when there are a few primary competitors. In general, non-practicing entities and others who do not compete directly with the infringer cannot satisfy the but-for causation test. Next slide. Construct for proving lost profits is an economic one. In essence, you're looking at a hypothetical but-for world where infringement has been factored out of the economic picture. Your expert or your proof is looking at, in essence, what would have happened had the infringer not infringed. The most common test used to prove lost profits is the Panduit test, as I indicated before, but that's not the exclusive means to prove lost profits. The patentee has to support the but-for world with sound economic proof, but lost profit awards have been based on a wide variety of reconstruction theories. The most important thing in trying to establish lost profits is to look at but-for causation and make sure that your expert accounts for all the factors that might affect profits in the real world. So for example, the expert should address price elasticity so if the patentee's price is higher than the infringer's, um, the expert needs to determine whether the patentee really would have made all of the sales that the infringer made at the patentee's higher price. Your expert may need to decrease the number of units to account for reduced sales at the higher price the patentee actually did charge. Your economist also has to look at the market and determine whether a sale by the infringer actually resulted in a lost sale to the patentee or whether customers would buy different products or products from different sellers. The Panduit factors require a showing of demand for the patented product and a lack of acceptable non-infringing alternatives. So not just alternatives, but ones that are acceptable in the marketplace. The patentee also has to show that it would have had capacity to make the sales as well as causation and the amount of damage. The amount of lost profits needs to be demonstrated using sound account, accounting and economic principles. Your economist or accountant needs to have an accurate model that includes items such as fixed and variable overhead and other factors that demonstrate the profits the patentee actually would have made but for the infringer's conduct. Next slide. Second main damages theory is a reasonable royalty. The idea behind a reasonable royalty is to return the value of what was taken. In other words, the value of the use of the patented technology should be used to measure the royalty. As I noted before, the most common approach in determining a reasonable royalty is the hypothetical negotiation, which is what the parties would have agreed to at the time the infringement began in terms of a license. Besides the Georgia Pacific factors and the hypothetical negotiation, there are other approaches to a reasonable royalty. The first is the so-called analytic approach, 
which involves calculating damages based on the infringer's own internal profit projections for the infringing product at the time the infringement began, and then apportioning the projected profit between the parties. The patentee's percentage of the profit is applied to the sales dollars for the actual infringing sales to determine the reasonable royalty. This method isn't used as often as a reasonable royalty under Georgia Pacific, but is not that uncommon because most companies project profits when embarking on a new project. Cost savings is another approach, and this one is particularly applicable in dealing with method patents. And you can use other royalty agreements as a comparison, or if there are numerous license agreements within a close range, close range prove a so-called established royalty. One way of determining damages, the so-called rule of thumb, which was 25% of the profits on an infringing device was abolished by the Federal Circuit. Another variant of the rule of thumb, the Nash bargaining solution, is also generally out, uh, even though it's based on Nobel Prize winning theory. The courts have found it akin to the 25% rule of thumb. And it's good to remember that the inquiries are always approximate um, because it's a hypothetical negotiation. So the most important thing to take into consideration is to base your damages theory on sound economic principles. Next slide. Um, a real common issue to run into in presenting damages recently is the problem that damages need to be apportioned. Initially, apportionment was that royalties should not be based on the entire product, but instead the smallest saleable patent practicing unit. So for example, you shouldn't base the royalty on an entire computer, but you may base it on a component such as a chip or a hard drive if your claims cover a chip or a hard drive. Um, the royalty should be based on the smallest component that practices the patents, and the claims should be more or less coextensive with the product that is the royalty base. To a certain extent, apportionment has been expanded beyond the smallest saleable unit, and there are often cases and arguments that seek apportionment between the patented features and the unpatented features of the product. I think the general rule to follow is that the smallest saleable unit may not suffice if the unit is not closely tied to the patent claims. For example, um, a component of a software module, um, you wouldn't be able to use the entire software module, even if that's the smallest saleable unit. Um, there is a way that you can attempt to recover a royalty or profits on the entire device. There's a narrow exception to apportionment known as the entire market value rule that applies where it can be shown that the patented feature creates the basis for the customer demand. Um, there are various ways of proving this, um, including survey evidence and using the infringer's own internal emails and documents. Recently, in Mentor Graphics, the Federal Circuit held that the basic principle of apportionment applies to all patent damages, both lost profits and reasonable royalty. The interesting thing about this case was that the Federal Circuit held that even though apportionment applies to lost profits, the patentee in this case satisfied apportionment by satisfying the Panduit factors. In other words, uh, the patentee really didn't have to apportion because it satisfied apportionment um, by simply proving the Panduit factors. Next slide, and I'll hand it over to Jim. Thanks, Laura. Uh, the next topic on our uh, discussion today is alternative fora for the litigation of patent claims. Uh, clearly one of the most popular and uh, in the last 20 years has been unfair import investigations at the International Trade Commission under Section uh, 337. I'll cover more details with respect to ITC proceedings shortly. Another alternative for, uh, or forum is the Court of Federal Claims. When the infringer is either the federal government or uh, a government contractor who is performing uh, certain acts or uh, making certain articles pursuant to uh, federal procure procurement, uh, through the government, then the sole uh, forum for litigation of those claims is the Court of Federal Claims uh, in Washington, D.C. Additionally, certain claims uh, with respect to the validity or invalidity of the claims can be brought 
and tried before the Patent Trial and Appeal Board uh, in uh, IPRs, uh, post-grant reviews, and uh, patent reexaminations. Uh, finally, an additional uh, form that could be considered is uh, ADRs, uh, where there is a contractual provision for alternative dispute resolution in a license agreement. Uh, the parties' uh, uh, claims may have to be adjudicated in the particular form uh, in the contractual provision. Additionally, uh, there are court annexed ADR programs uh, such as mediation and early neutral evaluation that parties may be uh, required to participate uh, in, but typically are not uh, uh, binding. Uh, finally, where uh, the parties agree to arbitrate their claims, the proceedings or the, the rules of the Federal Arbitration Act, 9 U.S.C. sections 1 through 14, uh, would be controlling, and additionally, Section uh, 294 of uh, the patent statutes, Title 35, uh, also encourages voluntary arbitration of patent disputes. The next slide, please. The International Trade Commission is an independent, quasi-judicial federal agency with broad investigative responsibilities on matters of trade. Section 337 unfair import investigations determine whether an imported product infringes United States intellectual property rights. Here, in order to have your dispute litigated before the International Trade Commission, the product must be imported into the United States. Additionally, it must be an article that is uh, imported not merely data, signals, or other electronic trans transfers of information. The uh, Section 337 also provides for broad in-rem jurisdiction over the accused imports. While personal jurisdiction is not required over the uh, respondents in the ITC investigation, uh, they simply uh, can uh, not appear and the uh, Commission would have authority to go ahead and uh, make binding determinations whether or not the imported goods infringe intellectual property rights of uh, the complainants. Some of the benefits of proceedings in the uh, International Trade Commission are they are quite fast. Uh, the current scheduling orders typically set up uh, upon initiation of the investigation to a uh, trial before an administrative law judge within roughly 18 months. Those dates are rarely extended. Uh, there is no jury uh, before an uh, unfair import investigation uh, at the ITC. However, the primary relief is injunctive. You are, can obtain a limited exclusion order, which would uh, exclude those items of, from those parties uh, and respondents who uh, actually litigate or who uh, jurisdiction is ex exercised over, you can have general exclusion orders, uh, which is the broadest scope of protection, uh, which would uh, cover the uh, accused goods regardless of who is importing or uh, uh, selling them in the United States. Uh, additional relief uh, includes cease and desist orders from the commission and uh, consent decrees and orders that the parties may enter into in settlement of uh, the investigation and complaint. With respect to uh, enforcing those orders, Customs and Border Pro uh, Protection personnel uh, can go ahead and, and have the authority to seize those products when they find them uh, entering the country uh, through any of the ports. Typically, that will require some level of uh, education and training of the customs uh, personnel to identify the goods uh, so that they can be used and pre prevented from coming into the slide, please. So the detractors of uh, International Trade Commission proceedings are that the costs are very much front-loaded. Uh, after the uh, the pleadings requirements is much more detailed 
than a typical uh, infringement complaint, uh, there, uh, which is, is encouraged that you'll actually go and meet with the uh, Office of Unfair Imports uh, with their staff and review the uh, draft complaint roughly a month or two before the investigation is initiated. Uh, then discovery is uh, very much front-loaded. Uh, times to respond to discovery demands are typically on the order of 10 days rather than the 30 days of the federal rules, and uh, proceedings will move forward uh, to an initial determination before the administrative law judge. There is limited res judicata or collateral estoppel effect of a determination that the products uh, being imported into the United States are infringed. Uh, and finally, the uh, ITC cannot award monetary damages, although uh, as part of a uh, settlement and consent order, there are on occasion uh, certain amounts of money paid as past damages as, and part of the uh, termination of the investigation. While most unfair, unfair import investigations concern infringement of U.S. patents, uh, Section 337 proceedings are increasingly used in trade secret cases, and particularly now with the uh, federalization of trade secret misappropriation in the Defense Trade Secret Act. Next slide, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, there is an important, uh, can we go back one slide, please? Uh, there is a requirement in not only showing uh, infringement uh, of a, a domestic industry requirement. And the domestic industry requirement has two prongs, a technical prong and an economic prong. To satisfy the technical prong, the complainant must show that its products or those of its licensee practice at least one claim of the asserted patent. Typically, uh, this technical prong is established with claim charts that are included as part of the complaint. And the vice or products of the complainant need not practice the same claim of the patent as the accused device. To satisfy the economic prong uh, with respect to articles protected by the patents at issue, the complainant will need to show significant investments in plant and equipment, significant employment of labor or capital, or a substantial investment in e exploitation including engineering, research and development, or licensing. And this is where, again, the licensing activities of a certain uh, qualitative and quantitative amount may suffice to establish a domestic industry to support jurisdiction in the ITC. Next slide, please. And Laura, back to you. Great. After going out, um, through the law of venue, um, I want to touch on the factors um, you might consider in selecting venue. Um, first of all, there are jurisdiction and venue, and as I discussed before, um, obtaining personal jurisdiction will generally require you to show that the defendant, at the very least, has committed acts of infringement in the district, although that may vary from district to district as to how much contact is required. And right now, if the Supreme Court does not change the application of the venue statutes, venue will be proper where there is personal jurisdiction. You want, obviously you may want to select a district with a home court advantage, and you will want to look at the speed of the jurisdiction and the cost. Speed can be based on various factors and can be the amount of time that particular milestones in the case are generally reached, such as Markman hearings, trials, and settlement. Costs can be impacted by the cost of counsel in general in the district, the added cost of local counsel, or the expected timing and amount of costs in a particular case, such as when discovery has to be complete. Um, in addition, your choice of venue can cause expenses for travel, both to the court um, and for depositions. Another important consideration in choosing venue is whether the venue favors plaintiffs or defendants on particular issues, such as summary judgment. There are statistics on who is more likely to win summary judgment motions, motions for a stay, and other type of common issues in the proceedings. The local patent rules will affect the speed and cost of the litigation, such as determining who has to make disclosures and when those disclosures have to occur. 
On the left is um, a graphic of the most popular patent litigation venues for the past year, um, which include um, the Eastern District of Texas, the District of Delaware, the Central District of California, the Northern District of Illinois, the District of New York, Jersey, and the Northern District of California. Next slide, please. Um, as I indicated, one of the factors in selecting venue is whether the venue favors the plaintiff or the defendant on certain issues. Um, on the left are recent statistics for motions for summary judgment in patent cases by district from January 2014 to June 2016. Um, these statistics include the most popular venues by number of filings and include the districts I listed before, plus the Southern District of New York, the Southern District of Florida, and the Southern District of California. I do want to note that the statistics for the Southern District of Florida are skewed heavily by the actions of one patentee, Shipping and Transit, which filed 110 suits in the district during the study period. Those suits terminated very quickly, settling after a median of just 65 days, which um, you need to keep in mind when looking at the speed statistics for the Southern District of Florida. Um, as you can see, the Eastern District of Texas is the least likely to grant summary judgment, whereas other districts you, that you might choose, including the Southern District of New York and the Southern District of Florida, are the most likely to grant summary judgment. The Eastern District of Texas patent cases tend to settle early and at high rates, and when cases do not settle, they generally make it to trial faster than patent suits litigated in other courts. That said, the Eastern District of Texas is only marginally faster than many other districts and is not the fastest overall. Among the popular districts for patent suits, um, the Southern District of Florida and the Eastern District of Virginia, the original rocket docket, um, are faster than the Eastern District of Texas. I would note, however, that the Eastern District of Virginia has recently imposed practices to limit the number of patent cases in its district, which it felt was limiting its ability to resolve cases quickly. In terms of um, success at trial, um, East Texas juries find for the patentee only slightly more often than the national average. While damages awarded by East Texas juries exceed the national average by a large margin, the median awards are quite modest. And actually both the District of Delaware and the Northern District of California have had higher median and mean jury awards during the period of study. And both districts had almost as many trials as the Eastern District of Texas, despite many fewer filings. The study referenced here notes that in Texas, parties um, sued for infringement in the Eastern District of Texas begin to incur discovery costs faster than similarly situated defendants litigating elsewhere in the country. They're usually also able to get venue transferred only after discovery is substantially complete. And the relative timing of discovery, transfer, and markman hearings, which usually occur about a year out, um, ensure that the accused infringer costs are front loaded. Thus, that venue favors um, cases that want to be resolved quickly um, and with a settlement. Um, cases that don't uh, merit such treatment, um, there are other districts such as Delaware or the Northern District of California that might actually be more favorable for patentees. Next slide. Another important consideration in choosing venue is whether you want to try to avoid having the district court stay the litigation due to a PTAB proceeding. It's common knowledge that defendants often want to stay the litigation, but there are also certain instances that plaintiffs want to stay the litigation, for example, to avoid expense and extra time if validity is the main issue to be resolved and the plaintiff doesn't want to have two proceedings going on at the same time. You should in general, consider this factor in choosing venue. Motions to stay pending inter partes review gr uh, granted range from over 70%, for example, in the Northern District of Illinois and the Southern District of Florida, to 60% in Delaware and the Northern District of California, to 50% in Texas, and 43% in the Southern District of California. So there are a lot of factors um, that you and statistics available to consider in choosing a district. Um, next slide, and I'll hand it back to Jim. 
And Jim, before you pick up again, I need to get in a couple of secret words here. Intellectual, I-N-T-E-L-L-E-C-T-U-A-L, intellectual and jurisdiction, J-U-R-I-S-D-I-C-T-I-O-N, jurisdiction. Thank you. Now back to Jim Muldoon. Thank you. Next slide, please. The next topic deals with some best practices for invalidity and infringement contentions. Traditionally, under the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, uh, particularly Rule 33, a party did not need to respond to contention interrogatories until near the close of discovery. That complicated matters with respect to uh, issues of infringement litigation where the defendant could not necessarily uh, get to a full reading of uh, how the plaintiff was interpreting uh, the claims, how the claims were being read upon uh, the accused product, and conversely, how the uh, defendant was reading prior art references to affect the validity of the asserted claims. Uh, over the last 20 years, a number of courts have adopted local patent rules, or in Delaware, it's covered by default standards, uh, that have substantially changed the practice in most of the high volume uh, district courts around the country. There clearly are many districts that still have not yet adopted local patent rules. These rules are typically implemented by a general order or incorporated at a uh, Rule 16 case management conference uh, and uh, uh, put into effect for a particular case under a scheduling order uh, which may only be revised under the good cause standard and with the judge's consent under Rule 16 before. Next slide, please. Typically now there are uh, initial sets of contentions that are required under patent rule districts uh, that require a party to uh, establish their basis for infringement by the accused device. These initial infringement contentions are generally served very early in discovery. They require the identification of each asserted claim of the patent. They have to identify the accused instrumentality, whether it be a device, a process, or a composition of matter that is accused of infringing. Uh, they typically require claim charts showing where each element is found in each instrumentality. If the patent claim includes means plus function limitation, then typically the initial infringement contentions will require the patentee to identify the structure which performs that function uh, described in that uh, means plus function limitation. Typically, they also require the identification of whether infringement is under the theory of literal infringement or under the doctrine of equivalence. Uh, a good example of a local patent rule uh, is the Northern District of California Rule 3-1 on the disclosure of asserted claims and infringement contention. Next slide, please. It's really important to know that even though there are uh, districts that have local patent rules, that these patent rules can vary dramatically as to the timing requirement of when initial or uh, responding or final uh, contentions are required to be served. Uh, for example, uh, here in uh, our list of several district courts, uh, the Northern District of Illinois, for example, uh, requires initial infringement contentions uh, have to be served 14 days after the initial disclosures and the initial disclosures are due 14 days after an answer. Most other districts typically use a uh, uh, Rule 16 conference uh, to go ahead and set forth uh, when those contentions are due, uh, and that timing of that conference uh, also may radically vary uh, between districts. In my own district up in the Northern District of New York, those infringement contentions are due 14 days after the Rule 16 conference. In the District of Delaware, under default standards, it's 30, rules, 30 days after a Rule 16 conference. And in the combined Southern and Eastern District 
of New York uh, rules that have been adopted. It's 45 days after the initial scheduling conference. Service of the infringement contentions typically sets the uh, deadline for initial either invalidity or invalidity and non-infringement contentions. Not all courts and sets of local rules require initial non-infringement contentions. Uh, here in uh, the same districts that we've mentioned before, uh, for example, Northern District of Illinois, invalidity contentions are due 14 days after infringement contentions. Therefore, those initial contentions may be fully served by the parties uh, before you ever see the judge in a Rule 16 conference. Uh, other districts have other time frames. Delaware and the Northern District of New York have 30 days after receipt or service of the initial infringement contentions. That's a 45-day requirement in the Southern and Eastern District. And in the newly enacted uh, Western, District, Western District of New York rules, where they don't seem to be particularly as uh, interested in moving them as fast as other districts, it's 60 days after uh, service of initial infringement contentions. But clearly, uh, local expertise with the local patent rules is uh, essential to effectively pursue your case uh, or defend it in the venue in which you've been sued. Next slide, please. Some local rules also require uh, mandatory and early uh, discovery or production of documents, uh, things to include uh, for example, here in the Northern District of California local rules, uh, a model that's been adopted in many other states, you have to produce a complete copy of the file history, uh, documents evidencing ownership and maintenance of the patent. Uh, certainly, you don't want to go ahead and, and find out uh, after you've filed suit that there's some defect in title uh, or the chain of ownership, and those documents here are required to be produced uh, early in the case. Additionally, uh, several local uh, sets of rules required production of documents evidencing any offers, sales, or public disclosures prior to the filing date of the application, uh, or, and documents evidencing conception or reduction to practice prior to the filing date. If a patentee's uh, uh, claims that it is selling a commercial embodiment uh, of the patent, it may have to produce documents to show the operation or structure of its own commercial embodiments. Uh, with respect to defendants, some early productions uh, in the District of Delaware, for example, require or identify core technical documents that must be identified or um, that must be produced uh, regarding the structure and operation of accused uh, instrumentalities. Additionally, a defendant may also be required to produce copies of prior art uh, that they claim are, are asserting uh, render the claims invalid that are not in the file history. Next document, please. With respect to final contentions, as you gear down for uh, close of discovery and, and movement into expert, uh, several sets of local rules require service of final contentions. Some of those uh, local rules require or, or determine the date of service of the final contentions from uh, the filing of the initial contentions. Again, for example, in the Northern District of Illinois, uh, where initial contentions are served very quickly, uh, the local rules require service of final contentions within 21 weeks, setting an outer limit on uh, the necessary discovery to make out your case. Otherwise, uh, Final contentions uh, can be supplemented pursuant to Rule 26E when disclosure is uh, found to be incomplete or incorrect or as uh, ordered by a scheduling order, uh, which only require, uh, allow um, supplementation or amendment of final contentions uh, on a good cause basis, uh, typically, you know, again, at least before the close of discovery. Circumstances that have been identified in local rules and case law to support good cause for amendment or supplementation of final uh, infringement or invalidity contentions are a claim construction decision uh, that is different than uh, 
the claim construction of the party that is proposing uh, to amend their contentions. Uh, recent discovery of prior art that was not found despite a diligent search, uh, or the discovery of non-public information regarding a, the accused instrumentality. Slide, please. Thanks, Jim. Um, I'm going to discuss strategies for the claim construction process, and quite often um, you're going to be involved in two proceedings, both a penned office and a district court proceeding. Um, as you probably know, the PTAB uses the broadest reasonable construction standard, and the district court uses the Phillips standard, which is the meaning that the term would have to a person of ordinary skill in the art. Um, while claim constructions can obviously be different under these two standards, um, I attended a conference with two PTAB judges, and they were asked whether the claim construction standard made a difference to them. Um, they stated that despite the burden of proof, um, they found district court claim constructions persuasive and that often they found no difference because they always aim for the best construction and usually the best construction will be the same under both standards. Um, as a defendant, you have 12 months to file an RPR petition from the date that you are served with the complaint and then the patent owner's preliminary response is due three months after that. Depending on the district, you may be able to obtain infringement contentions serve your invalidity contentions, and get the plaintiff's responses to those contentions before you have to file the petition. Although it lessens the chance for a stay, if you delay the IPR petition, you may be able to pin down some of what the patentee will allege by getting the patentee's infringement contentions and its responses to invalidity contentions. Um, in addition, some districts have a mechanism for requiring the patentee to narrow the number of asserted claims, or you can somehow get those reduced during litigation to limit what needs to be challenged in the IPR. In any event, the Markman hearing will most likely occur after the deadline for filing the petition, although if you do it a few um, months early, you may get the patentee's um, claim construction and the patent owner's response before the year is out. Um, and you should always consider the difference or the strain between the claim construction you want for infringement and the claim constructions you want for validity purpose purposes. Next slide. Um, other strategies for the claim construction process include limiting the terms you choose to be construed to ones that are dispositive of your case, whether that's infringement or you need to succeed on validity, um, or at the very least limit to those that will have a significant impact. You should choose the simplest and most direct construction consistent with your position because the simpler the claim construction, the more likely the court is to adopt it. In your briefs and your presentation, explain the technology, the context of the invention and the prior art and how the invention solves the problem or how the solution was already known in the prior art. Even though technically the claims should be construed in light of the specification and other intrinsic evidence, giving a background so that the court knows what the consequences of the claim constructions are and how they affect the infringement analysis is useful. So if you're the patentee, um, you should present the claims to be construed using the context of the accused device, even though technically the claim is not to be construed in light of the accused device, it can be used to give context. If you are the accused infringer, you can look to the prior art and use the prior art as a backdrop for your claim construction. Finally, you should always use demonstratives, even if you decide to limit them to clips of the specification and, and drawings. Next slide. A particular issue in claim construction is Section 101 challenges. Under the Alice case and others, the scope of the claim is important in determining subject matter eligibility. In short, the court will look at what the claims are directed to, whether they are directed to one of the patent ineligible concepts, and then also look at the elements of the claim to see whether they transform the nature of the claim into a patent eligible application of the patent ineligible concept. So the question is, do you want to do claim construction? 
as the cases state here, it's easy to go ahead and just make a Rule 12b6 motion, and the courts will often rule on the merits of the motion unless the plaintiff raises a good reason why claim construction is necessary. If the claims need to be construed because there is a dispute on claim construction material to the Section 101 analysis, you will want to get that hashed out with the other party before making the motion. Um, the courts have broad discretion concerning the appropriate time to address Section 101, and claim construction disputes in general should be resolved prior to a Section 101 analysis. If you are the plaintiff or the patent holder, make sure that you raise these issues early and often so that the court does not hold that claim construction issues are waived or consider them unimportant. Next slide. Laura James, just to let you know, we're getting pretty close to that one hour mark. Okay, great. Um, here's an example of claim construction saving a claim from Section 101. Um, the claims at issue did not explicitly recite reading data in a distributed fashion, but the district court construed the claims to include this feature based on statements in the specification that reading data in a distributed fashion was a critical advancement over the prior art. So the district court read a limitation into the claim at the invitation of the patentee, and the Federal Circuit held that the claims survived a Section 101 challenge because they entailed an unconventional technological solution, which was enhancing data in a distributive fashion to the technological problem of massive record flows that previously required massive databases. Okay, on to the next uh, slide, and Jim will take over. Okay, I'll try and move through this relatively quickly. These types of uh, uh, PTAB proceedings have uh, been around now for uh, at least five years with the introduction of the AIA. Uh, ex parte reexamination is unchanged, and we can go on to the next slide. Ex parte reexamination uh, has to be based on uh, prior art patents and printed publications. The standard is whether or not the petition raises a substantial new question of patentability, and after uh, the uh, Reexamination is initiated, the requester is not involved. Uh, there is no legal estoppel effect so that a, uh, a party who has, uh, is undergoing uh, infringement litigation uh, can at any time uh, initiate an ex parte reexamination regardless of already having lost on validity issues in district court. On the next slide, please. Interparties review was uh, brought in as a replacement to interparties reexam in the AIA. It proceeds before a panel of three judges. Uh, the standard is set up uh, here as a reason but, uh, that the uh, challenger will prevail with at least, with respect to at least one of the claims challenged. Uh, the time frame is uh, very quick here. Uh, you're supposed to get a decision uh, statutorily required within 12 months of the grant of a petition of very limited opportunities to extend that. Uh, the real issue that we'll get to shortly here is how estoppel has been interpreted now by the PTC and the courts, uh, and IPR is available for all patents regardless of the issue date. But if you're going to commence an IPR, a defendant must commence that IPR, file that petition, within one year of service of the complaint. Next slide, please. This grant review is uh, a broader range of defenses. Uh, it is only eligible for patents filed after March 16th, 2013, which have just been issuing in the last few years and is becoming an increasing, uh, increasingly used opportunity to challenge validity. Uh, it must be raised uh, within 90 days after the issuance of the patent, and there is a slightly higher standard or threshold uh, regarding uh, it's more likely than not that a challenge claim is unpatentable. Uh, there is a uh, transitional period in which covered business method review uh, is available where a party has been sued or is charged with infringement of a covered business method, uh, and it also has similar estoppel issues, uh, but the covered business method must include a method or corresponding apparatus for performing data processing or other operations in the practice, administration, or management of a financial product or service. Next slide. The real issue now that's, that's percolating through the courts is uh, whether the ex 
uh, and how the explicit estoppel provisions of the AIA are and the uh, post-grant proceedings are being interpreted uh, between the courts and the PTAB. Uh, Section 315E prevents a petitioner from uh, asserting in district court that a claim is invalid on any ground that the petitioner raised or could reasonably could have raised during either the IPR or the post-grant review. Uh, unfortunately, you know, while that is a fairly broad reading of estoppel, not only covering grounds raised, but those that reasonably could have been raised, uh, the courts have not been applying that estoppel uh, as broad as it was anticipated. In SAS Institute v. Complementsoft, uh, came through the Federal Circuit uh, last year, uh, the PTAB had instituted only on some of the challenge claims, but not all of the claims of the patent. After completion of the IPR, the instituted claims were found invalid. Uh, under current Federal Circuit practice, uh, in the uh, uh, issuing of a decision on the IPR, uh, the Federal Circuit only lists the grounds for the instituted claims. And in SAS Institute, there was therefore no estoppel where the PTAB did not institute uh, against uh, a particular claim. And there's an interesting uh, Judge Newman dissent uh, in that case, uh, dealing with uh, how that estoppel was applied. Uh, also, last year in the Federal Circuit, the Shaw Industries Group case uh, versus automated creel systems uh, was uh, decided, and in that case, there was no estoppel where the ground uh, asserted uh, in the petition uh, was not adopted. Uh, they, they had submitted uh, multiple claims to challenge the validity of a patent in an IPR petition, but uh, the PTAB had only uh, initiated on uh, some of the grounds, not all of the grounds with respect to that claim, uh, as those additional grounds were found to be redundant. In that Shaw case, then, there was no estoppel uh, in the district court proceeding for the infringer to come back and reassert uh, that the claim was now invalid over a um, ground or on a ground that had been raised in an IPR petition on a claim on which the IPR was instituted. Uh, this creates some interesting uh, uh, interpretations. Uh, Judge Robinson in Intellectual Ventures versus Toshiba uh, just a few months ago in the District of Delaware, uh, relying on Shaw, uh, found uh, no estoppel where a reference wasn't raised in the petition uh, as a natural outcome of uh, the Federal Circuit's uh, rationale and, and reasoning of the Shaw Industries Group. Therefore, if the grounds that are uh, were actually included in a petition but not instituted on, on claims that were challenged in a petition but where those claims were not instituted on, uh, or where there's a reference that even wasn't uh, raised on a peti in a petition, uh, what does the could have raised language of section 315 actually mean. And I think there's still some uh, additional uh, reconciliation of the various opinions to be had uh, on how that estoppel is applied. And I believe that's my last slide. Next slide, please. Um, basically, um, in developing your reasonable royalty case, um, you're going to want to um, collect and assemble um, certain types of evidence. You need to have a basic financial model as a foundation. The most common bases for a reasonable royalty are comparable license agreements, um, the actual licensing practices of the patentee or the infringer, and um, a lump sum, which is really another form of a license agreement. 
Um, and here you need to have proof why the licenses and arrangements are comparable, both from a technological and an economic standpoint, or if you're going to use another basis for the reasonable royalty uh, besides the license agreement to provide reasons why the licensees, licenses and technology are not comparable. Generally, your technical expert should provide a comparison between the technologies at issue in the license agreements that have been produced and opine that they are or are not comparable, and the damages expert will take the financial and economic terms of the licenses and do the same thing. Um, for example, in the Carnegie Mellon case, the defendant argued that the existence of certain lump sum licenses compelled the choice of a lump sum license for the structure of a reasonable royalty, but the plaintiff successfully argued that those licenses were not comparable. In essence, the district court found that there was not any established royalty and that the hypothetical negotiation would have had to address both the financial terms and the basic structure of the deal, including whether it was a running royalty or a lump sum. The jury chose the running royalty offered by the plaintiff and awarded over a billion dollars, which was affirmed by the federal circuit, except it remanded the case um, for the district court to determine whether certain sales were extraterritorial. If there are no comparable licenses, sometimes the profitability of the patent practicing products for the infringer can be a basis for the royalty. For example, in the AstraZeneca case, uh, profitability was a factor in the reasonable royalty, with the court noting that even after paying the substantial royalty sought by the plaintiff, the defendant would still make its typical profit margin of 31 to 48 percent. In the Carnegie Mellon case, the plaintiff's expert performed an analysis to, in essence, determine the portion of the defendant's profits that could be attributable to the infringing method to arrive at a royalty. Another factor in a reasonable royalty is the effect of the defendant's entry into the market on the plaintiff's pricing. Um, for example, if the defendant compete against and undercut the plaintiff, that fact will support a higher reasonable royalty. Another basis to arrive at a beginning financial value for royalty is to value the infringing features based on comparable features in the marketplace. Um, for example, in Apple versus Motorola, the expert compared the claimed features to an Apple trackpad and compared the price of the trackpad to the price of a traditional computer mouse to isolate the value of the invention. Um, in other words, the trackpad had features that made it more desirable than a computer mouse, so the expert used the difference between the two prices to value the features. In I4I limited partnership, the expert used a non-infringing custom standalone XML editor as a benchmark for establishing the royalty base for an infringing XML editor incorporated in Microsoft Word. The expert can also use cost savings from the use of the infringing product. In Powell versus Home Depot, the plaintiff created a safety feature for a radial saw and a reasonable royalty was awarded not based on the party's expected profits or on an existing license, but rather the cost to replace non-compatible saws and the savings to Home Depot due to a lack of injur injuries, plus the fact that it could retain a lot, of, a significant number of lumber sales by having the types of saws covered by the patent available in the store. <clears throat> 